Welcome to the second of our Jesus Talks, where we begin to look at the accounts about Jesus. As we begin, we must face our first major question of method. All the direct eyewitness accounts that we have are from people who became convinced followers of Jesus. But as Bishop Leslie Newbigin used to say, we don't find anyone who witnessed the miracles or resurrection of Jesus simply writing in their diary saw something interesting today. In addition, Jesus quite deliberately seems to have told people around him to minimise the publicity surrounding him and his actions. So we don't find him discussed in the surviving writings of people who were outside the immediate circle of influence. Within the circle of his life, there is a very strong impression together with multiple eyewitness accounts. But beyond that circle, especially as we move out beyond the geographical world of Israel, we don't find anything like newspaper columns discussing the Jesus phenomena. Those that were directly involved wrote a great deal about him and were very diligent about recording accurate accounts of what happened. But we find very little of merely curious or general thought about Jesus. This is important to think about because one classic mistake modern people make is to project the massive publicity about Jesus that came later back onto the circumstances of first century Palestine. I was reading about a man who'd been a leading follower of Jesus at a Bible college, and yet he gave it all up because he felt sure that if Jesus was all that later generations thought about him, then Jesus should have been constantly discussed in the letters and diaries of ordinary people all around the Mediterranean world and beyond. Well, it is a sweet thought and that kind of chronological confusion has often plagued the study of Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, the Jesus movement eventually came to dominate so much of global culture in such a way that it is hard to imagine that even a hundred years afterwards, people were not all that interested in it. Nevertheless, we need to view history as it really happened rather than as it might be portrayed in novels or films or over-enthusiastic religious imaginations. If we're to take the eyewitness bio biographies at face value, then we're not dealing with something that would have been discussed in the local taverns in Greece in 33 AD. It might have been discussed in 133 AD in at least some of the taverns, but the three years of Jesus' public activity was not immediately disseminated through the chattering classes of North Africa, Western Asia and Southern Europe. There do seem to be passing references to Jesus, or at least his followers, in Pliny, Tacitus and Josephus. There are many arguments about the weight or validity of these sources, so it may not be wise to read too much into them one way or the other. Josephus, writing in the middle of the first century, refers to Jesus as the Messiah, though some claim that later Christians inserted this reference. Tacitus in the later first century mentions that the Christians were blamed for starting Nero's fire in Rome, 
And then in the early second century, Pliny asks for legal advice about dealing with Christians. As we work through the life and teaching of Jesus in the coming studies, we will see that he deliberately and purposefully avoids publicity and constantly avoids actions that would bring him into the wider public or political radar. When Jesus had the chance to explain himself to the political leaders of the region, he chose to say absolutely nothing to them. He clearly saw fame and influence in very different ways than perhaps we do. He could easily have dominated the media in the region, but over and over again prevents that from happening. Listen carefully to these incidents from the beginning of Mark's biography. Notice how Jesus is constantly trying to prevent his identity and mission from getting out. So this is from what we call Mark chapter 1 verses 32 to 45. That evening after sunset the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So later we will study an incident when one of the most powerful people in the world had a private meeting with Jesus away from the public gaze and offered Jesus a publicity deal that would have made Jesus the most publicly famous person in the ancient world. Jesus was actually encouraged to set up a publicity event that would have quickly gained media interest. Yet Jesus rejected the deal and kept his mission a much more private affair. In fact, it seemed as if even his very closest friends and confidants were unclear about what Jesus was going to do, even days or hours before his mission was completed. So first, a dose of realism. On the one hand, we have more documents about this historical person and his movement than any other person in antiquity. And we have four eyewitness accounts that were widely received and respected among that Jesus movement from the early generations. It seems that there were all kinds of stories about him circulating among his followers before any of the biographies were written down. Well, as Luke tells us. However, we don't have discussions or descriptions contained in 
people's general letters and journals of the period. Of course, we only have a tiny fraction of all the letters and journals written in the first century, but outside of the Jesus movement, we just don't find discussions about Jesus of Nazareth in the bits that we do have. One school of thought would say that we should restrict our research only to those historical sources that come from outside the Jesus movement. And the idea here is that those who became dedicated followers of Jesus were too emotionally and personally involved to give an objective account of what happened, whereas a disengaged account from a Roman centurion in his diary or a Samaritan merchant in his local history records would be um, more objective and reliable. There are two difficulties with this. The first is that these events did not seem to allow people to be so disengaged from what was happening. We just don't get those mildly interested references that might seem so appealing to a particular kind of historical research. Jesus of Nazareth and all the events surrounding him and even leading up to him don't seem to allow us to keep it all at arm's length as if we could view it all from a safe distance. This stuff gets underneath our skin, into our heart and soul, echoing around in our minds. Just as in the very first generation, these events involve us and speak to us. Jesus himself says that people can only really evaluate where he came from and what he's doing if they first engage with his teaching and put it into practice. So mildly interested objectivity is not only hard to find when we come to Jesus of Nazareth, but it may not even be desirable. Which brings us to the second problem. The biographies of Jesus are much more valuable than a mere collection of disinterested eyewitness statements. One of these biographies of Jesus was written by a man called Luke, an, an educated doctor who travelled around the Mediterranean observing the progress of the Jesus movement through Asia Minor, Greece and onto Rome. Luke specifically explains the historical methods he used when compiling his biographical account of Jesus. And so listen to these opening words in his introduction. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke was doing more than simply compiling an anthology of eyewitness accounts. He had plenty of those and he seems to suggest that there were plenty of those doing the rounds at the time. However, Luke felt that this material needed to be ordered and explained if Theophilus was going to get a proper understanding of what happened. In other words, history involves a lot more than simply collecting impressions or random eyewitness accounts. On November the 22nd, 1963, someone might have written in their diary that a man had been shot in Dallas. A man may have been shot in Dallas many times before and many times since, yet to describe that particular shooting in such sparse words is to give really a false impression of what happened. John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States of America, was shot 
on that day. And it was like an earthquake to the society and institutions of that period of modern history, the reverberations of which may still be felt. Without giving any context or weight to the events, such simple words are perhaps less than truthful. In that same way, to say simply that a baby was born around 4 BC in humble circumstances, or a man was crucified at Passover around 33 AD, is not a careful objective account of what happened, but a weirdly inadequate report of an event that changed the entire history, not just of Judaism and the nation of Israel, but also of the Roman Empire and in fact the Persian Empire in the entire world. Another example. On September the 11th, 2001, the very first report said simply that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. As time went on in the day, the reports changed. Now a terrorist attack on New York was in view. With greater hindsight, those events are now described in a much bigger context of Al-Qaeda and an identity crisis in radical Islam. An account written of that tragedy one day or even one week after it happened would not be so accurate or balanced as one that is written much later when a better understanding is possible and when all the eyewitness accounts can be put in order. So the biographies of Jesus both set out the historical events, but they also try to explain why these events were so important and what was really going on when these things were happening. These historical documents set the life of Jesus, not only in terms of a specific timeline, but also in the context of a long history of ancient prophecies and events that stretch back over thousands of years.